a genetic map for the Lobati. I'm going to give a brief explanation about why we would want to do that while you feast your eyes on our seed tree. Ooh. The people, just part of the immense supporting cast that it took to make the genetic map I'm going to show you. These are the main players. The PIs on the top, the graduate students who did most of the work on the bottom, and one of those students is here today, Chris Heim. Okay. This is my seed tree. This is Quercus rubra, a species typical Quercus rubra. Now, you have heard from other speakers how you can take a very small handful of genetic markers or a very small bit of DNA sequence and ascertain the genetic diversity of an oak species, ascertain where that genetic diversity is, what the phylogeny is, what that tree is related to. You can do all those things with a very small amount of genetics and genomics data. But there is one thing you cannot do. With that small amount of data, you cannot place where the genes are and how the genes interact in genetic networks to produce the phenotypes that we see on the ground. And that would not be important if we were living in a state of nature and Mother Nature could just adjust as she has always done. We have now so influenced the biogeography of the planet that if we are to conserve and maintain our oak forest, we need to understand something about the genetic basis of adaptation and the genetic basis of resistance to the diseases and pests that all of our forests are subject to. So we make genetic maps. And why do we make genetic maps? We make genetic maps so that we can locate these genes by associating them with phenotypes in a structured progeny, a full sib population, for example, just like they do in humans and crop plants and livestock breeding. So. Genes occur along a chromosome like this in a nice linear array, right? And if we want to focus in on those genes, then uh, in the old days, we could make a genetic map that looked like this. And in between those intervals, there might be 20,000 genes. That doesn't narrow it down much. With the genomics tools that we have now, we can make a map that looks like this. And in theory, that will help us to better ascertain what the genetic networks are. Well, why go through all this bother of making a map when you can just do a whole genome sequence? And then we can get every single base pair all laid out nice and neatly for each of the 12 chromosomes of Corcus. One, two, three, up into 12, right? Does anybody here believe that we can do that? Good, because we can't. What you get, even with the best technology and the smartest minds in the world when you do a whole genome sequence, is you get pieces. You get bigger and smaller pieces. When we do a whole genome sequence on a tree genome that has 12 chromosomes, for example, if we get 20,000 pieces, we're happy. Okay? That is a good result. So. It turns out that the genetic maps that we could make in 1930 are very, very useful for sorting out those pieces. All right, now the data slides. Christopher Friedlein, a couple of years ago, generated a list of why we do genetic maps. That is such a good list, I'm simply going to recapitulate it here. I couldn't do a better job than he did, with a few added comments by me. Okay. These are the three reasons why you make genetic maps. These three reasons look good to the funding agencies, and they are sound reasons. You can sort out the order of the contigs when you do a whole genome sequence, provided that your genetic map is very densely populated and very high quality. You can, with a genetic map, provide a context for that phenotypic variation you see in your structured populations. And for the evolutionary biologists in the room, some of us care very much about the theory of how natural selection has worked. There are various theoretical models out there that say 
genes that are important in natural adaptation should be clustered in the genome, and there are alternative theories that say, no, epistasis is a thing, and evolutionary biologists can argue about it, but with a densely populated genetic map, we can actually test these things. Okay. Densely populated, high-quality genetic maps in oaks, unlike what was asserted by Christopher Friedlein, are not easy, and they are not quick, which is why there exist in the world so few of them. Antoine Kramer and Catherine Baudinis, who are here in the audience today, they and their colleagues generated the first genetic maps in Quercus, in Quercus rober, Quercus patria, and an interspecific cross of Quercus rober and Quercus patria, and those, those maps are the first ones and the best ones published to date. And there will be more. Just to remind uh, the American audience, this is the native range of Robur and Petria. Because these ranges are so extensively inter uh, overlapping, and because there is a significant latitudinal as well as an altitudinal gradient in this area, you can take your genetic maps and you can do them to study the genetic structure of variation on the landscape of genetic ad adaptation and also the extent of introgression among the roboride oaks. In the last 15 years, there's been an extensive body of literature produced on that. When I moved from the private sector studying quantitative genetics in corn to the forestry department at Purdue, and I, I thought to myself, well, I'm, I'm, I'm going to do what I did in corn and oaks. I had no idea of what I was doing. No idea at all. I knew this is Quercus rubra. This is its native range, good-sized native range. Uh, not much of an altitudinal gradient, but certainly a latitudinal gradient. I thought, I can do what the, what the people at INRA are doing, or at least part of it, all right? How hard could this be? This is northern red oak is a dominant oak, has a very wide range, represents the Labati, the red oaks of the New World. That's good. St. Patrick with many other Labati, much potential for studying introgression. When pollinated, a lot of potential for studying gene flow across the landscape. It's diploid, which is rather essential when you start out. It has only 12 chromosomes, as do all Quercus. And the genome size is it's not small, but it's reasonable, 700, 800. We're not really sure with Rubra because we, we haven't done the sequencing, but it's been estimated to be in this range. What I did not know when I agreed to do this, but I know now, is that this tree has a two-year acorn making structure crosses a bit awkward. So early in my career, I went over to France and I had a talk with Antoine Kramer and he suggested to me, since controlled crosses aren't very feasible, that he said, well, of all the pollen parents on a single tree, perhaps there are one or two dominant pollen parents, and in this way, you can get a population of full sibs if you are just patient, patient and genotype a lot of acorns. Why a full sib population? Because I knew from my work in the private sector and from being a quantitative geneticist for 15 years previous, that the full sib population has the most statistical power to locate the markers along the map like this. You can do this in other populations, but the full sib population is the best. So maybe Mother Nature is going to help us out here. So what we did was I walked around the Purdue campus, identified the tree that I liked the best, i.e. the one that masted two years in a row. And I said, I'm going to pick all the acorns off this tree. We're going to stratify them. Northern red oak acorns must be stratified. After three months, we're going to pull them out of stratification. And a wildlife biologist had just given a seminar at Purdue right before I did this saying, squirrels bite the tops off of northern red oak acorns and then cache them. Squirrels have been seen doing this. And those acorns can grow. So I thought, all right, we'll chop the tops off get the DNA out of the top of the seed, because this is a cotyledon, it's the same genotype as the embryo, and then stick that acorn right in the potting mix. 
it do, this doesn't bother a northern red egg cone at all. The germination rate is 99%. In fact, you can stick this acorn in unsterilized dirt and it will still germinate. We did a parentage analysis of all the acorns on the seed tree and all the Quercus rubro within 200 meters of that seed tree. And I wouldn't be here talking you, to you today if this hadn't worked, so did it work? Yes, it did. It worked fabulously well. There's the chart, there's the bar chart for those of you who like bar charts. Now, we got lucky. Okay, it doesn't always work this well when you just genotype all the acorns looking for full sibs. But we were lucky, this worked fabulously well, just in case you think this is masting years. No, 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 no. My tree, my seed tree, SM1, masts every single year as reliable as clockwork. Those represent funding years. <laughs> Honest, truly. Okay, so now we can do it. So after many years of hopping up and down, we did this, and finally in 2010, we were funded to actually do the meat of the thing. So here is the current status of our northern red oak mapping population. We established 509 full sibs at Purdue and at the University of Tennessee at a nursery in western Tennessee. In 2013, Mark Cogsall, who will speak after me, grafted most of the surviving trees. They were, at Purdue, they were fine, but in the site at, in Tennessee, they were not doing well. So Mark grafted them up, 409 survivors, in replicated grafts, and, and our parents, and he took them off to a nursery at the University of Missouri at the, at the, at the, Center for Agroforestry in New Franklin, Missouri. Some of you have been there. We have backup clonal replicates of the seed parent, SM1. SM2 seems to have a moral objection to being cloned, but Mark tells me there are still two clones of, of the seed parent that are still not dead. So we're hoping to get uh, two clones of the pollen parent. We're hoping to get the pollen parent as well. Now we're doing, because we have the population, we can do these studies to find quantitative trait loci, QTL, for leaf morphology, bud burst, marcescence, and a whole suite of physiological data that Mark will tell you about. Why marcescence? Who cares about marcescence? Well, we're doing marcescence because we can, the pollen parent is fully marcescent at the age of almost 50 years. It holds on to its leaves all winter, even though it is Quercus rubra, whereas SM1 drops those leaves in this bare branch, even by this time of year. Okay, so here's the workflow for what we actually did this, use a full sieve mapping population. That was a criteria of mine. We made a framework map with GSSR and ESTSSR markers from Quercus rubra and with ESTSSR markers from Quercus rober, one of the, the maps that Antoine Kramer and his colleagues had generated. Then to fill in many, many more markers, we used a reduced representation sequencing technology, which I will summarize for you momentarily, to map many, many more markers, several thousand in the, in the map I will show you today. And we actually did this last. We mapped the Rober EST SSR markers to the map. Well, it took that long to screen through the markers that we had and generate the map I will show you today. This is not the final map. Maps are never final, just like genome sequencing projects are never final. You tweak, you improve, and they get better and better uh, in the fullness of time. I'm showing you now our framework map. Okay. When we show maps, when, when people like us show maps, you're always going to see something like this. All right. This, these are the first six chromosomes. The green markers are the markers of Quercus rober. Okay. So we can take these, the, mark, the, the microsatellites that are embedded in real genes. These sequences tend to be somewhat highly conserved and they work across the sections of Quercus. So when we take the rubber marker here, Pierre 20, and the French have identified that as linkage group one, this marker maps to this linkage group 
we have identified it as linkage group one in the belief that the maps will be highly collinear, and so with all the linkage groups. So everything that is green is a rober marker, okay? The star here, the asterisk, is to show you that we screened a few Chinese chestnut EST SSRs, and one of them was in a mappable configuration, and it's right here, Chinese chestnut 3815. We have mapped this marker here from Rober. It has four alleles, and we mapped it to two places, here and here. Okay, I thought, I thought Antoine and Catherine might be interested in that result. Here are the other chromosomes. Now, this is just a free mark map, all right? And the way mapping works is you don't get to know ahead of time where your markers are going to go, so you always end up with at least one linkage group that doesn't have much on it. But I was not going to come to this meeting unless I had at least one rubber marker on every linkage group, and we managed to do that. Well, my graduate student managed to do that by me frowning at her and saying, Arpita, you are going to be in the lab this weekend, yes? <laughs> So this is a summary of that framework map. It's good to have a framework map when you're doing uh, a marker technology called double digest rad tags because you have much more confidence in the placement of your markers. So reduced representation sequencing, what is that? This is a technology whereby you, you take restriction enzymes, enzymes that cut DNA in certain places, and chop up your genome into defined little pieces, and you take a subset of those little pieces, and you, you, you put linkers and tags through a complex process on the little pieces, and by sequencing those little pieces, you're looking for variation in the nucleotide sequence between your two parents. You're looking for polymorphisms in that way. It's vastly cheaper than whole genome sequencing, and it means you can get your arms around this data for a reasonable price in a reasonable time and generate a very dense genetic map in theory. Okay. The technology we used was something called double digest rad tags because we used two different restriction enzymes to get the pieces. Uh, you sequence these with a tech platform called Illumina HiSeq. It's, some of you have heard of this. It's Illumina, the Illumina HiSeq technology is being used all around the world to sequence everything in sight. It, it delivers very small sequences, but in this case, that's all we demand of it, just very small sequences. We did this in such a way that we could determine how many individuals to sequence per lane, the way the technology works is you can only sequence so much stuff per lane, okay? So the more individuals you put in the lane, the less good sequence you're gonna get. So we chose to have this done by Beijing Genomics Institute in Beijing, and we could determine how many individuals we put per lane. So we decided since we had, we had no reference genome at that time, we would devote one whole lane to just the two parents, the seed parent and the pollen parent, and then in each of the other lanes, only 50 individuals. So why did we only do 225, a subset of the 399? Well, it was because of that other omics Economics. <laughs> we couldn't afford to do 399 and still get all the bioinformatics done. Okay, this t cost only only 12,000 U.S. dollars, but I knew that the bioinformatics was going to cost many more dollars than that. Okay, don't read all this like mad. Just know that these are the steps to do the bioinformatics for this kind of data. Move, remove the sequencing errors, remove the organelle sequences and the highly repetitive sequences, select the most believable SNPs. We don't have a reference genome, so we've got to use the two parents. Then you genotype the progeny relative to the parental alleles and you generate SNP calls and then you generate a VCF file and you give it to the PI who says you made your calls wrong, you gotta do it all over, so then you do it all over. We use two different haplotype colors for those people who like techno stuff. 
Then you convert that file into a join map format, and then you merge it with the framework markers, and then you perform more QC filtering steps, and now you have a join map file, and now you can spend six months generating the genetic map. All the while, while your colleagues are looking at you and saying, have you done that yet? Yes. Only people who do genetic mapping know that it is not easy and not quick, and you get really tired of hearing people saying, are you going to get done with that yet? Catherine, am I right? <laughs> yeah, because she's the only other person in this room who knows the, the pain and the glory of doing this. For you people, I'm, gonna, I'm running out of time here, but for you people who like comparison of haplotype calling tools, we used, we found that SAM tools work best. With SAM tools, we got 79, 78,000 SNPs. After we chucked out all the data with more than 30% missing data across the progeny, went down to 44,000. This is the distribution of types of marker. I won't go into why we care, but we do. This filtering step tosses out the ones that we don't believe because they don't meet our genetic expectation. Mendelian genetics is a thing, so we can test that. That left us with 2,736 markers that we could map in time for this meeting along with our framework markers and, by the way, for those of you who want to do this, bioinformatics is going to cost three times as much at least and take five times as long at least as the sequencing and there isn't any high throughput bioinformatics because it involves the a lot of very smart people, smarter than I am, and you can't, you can't squish them into an Illumina sequencing machine. You just have to give them the problem and let them think about it and construct pipelines to make it work. So this isn't dump it into the black box and get your answer out. Not at all, not at all. Okay, just to review, markers and progeny. This is chromosome one, or linkage group one, three, four, five, six. This is linkage group two, which I broke into four just to show you. I'm not making stuff up here. This is the real deal. This is 15 years of my life, so I have to show it to you. <laughs> now, if I were smarter, If I were smarter, I'd have done this faster if I had known then what I know now. But we always say that, don't we? Okay, here's 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. The grouping is done at log 22, third round regression mapping, techno stuff, no rearrangement of the original framework map. All these markers have sequence. We can relate these to the Quercus Rober contigs that were recently published in April of this year. I can hardly wait till Catherine's paper comes out relating their map to the Quercus Rober contigs. We have already mapped 45 of these rad tags to our unmapped Quercus Rubra EST SSRs. And just to show you that I'm not making stuff up, here's some, here's some close ups of what those look like, seven, eight, and nine. 10, 11, and 12. This is a map that is good enough, we think, to use for these purposes. And we haven't even mapped all the markers yet. We've got to bring in the other two classes of markers. It'll take about two months just for the computations. In 2014, the, the, the parents became grandparents. In 2013, Two or three of the F1s became reproductive. This is Northern Red Oak. This never happens. So I'm beginning to think I really am the luckiest person on the planet. Now we have a three generation pedigree. And if I can't convince our NSF to fund that, then I'm just not very good and I'll have to hand it over to a younger person. <laughs> This takes a very big cast. I know I'm running out of time. You can read them for yourself. But all these people were critically important in, in doing this. I want to especially thank Jim McKenna at, the, at Purdue for noticing that our F1s were reproductive in making acorns. This is another supporting cast. Almost every one of the European labs has a name on these two papers. 
So I want to, I am, I am indebted to their efforts and to the efforts of my colleague Oliver Galing here who participated in this project. He's sitting in the back, very quiet as always. Thank you Mother NSF for funding this. And I want to especially thank Antoine Kramer for giving me the idea which I was stubborn enough to try and think we could actually do. Thank you. Thank you.